Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening with our partnership between the Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library and the Florida Holocaust Museum. We are bringing a very special program tonight. So allow me to introduce myself. My name is Amanda. I'm with the Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library System. It is my honor to introduce this evening Aaron Blankenship and Marie Silverman who will be speaking with us. But before we get into the introductions, I do want to share with you a book shout out. So if you come to our programs, you know at every program we do a, ref, uh, we do a referral to a book or a service within the system. And today we're doing something pretty special because these book shout outs are actually from Marie herself. So these are books she's read in the past year that she has shared with us that she thought you might like to read as well. So the books are A Woman of No Importance, The Island of Sea Women, and The Stationery Shop. And Marie, if you have anything, you know, feel free. If you have, want to let the viewers know anything about any of the books, uh, you can let us know or we will let them know. You can find them all on our Overdrive or our Libby service. Those are all digital streaming services. You can also find them in the regular catalog at hdplc.org slash books. So these are Marie's recommendations. They will enjoy it. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. So these are the books that you've enjoyed this year, we know, and we know you're a big reader as well. Yeah. So uh, we definitely trust your recommendations. Well, let's get into the program tonight. We're going to learn about Marie Silverman, and she's going to be introduced by Erin Blankenship. Erin is through the Florida Holocaust Museum, who we are partnering with on this program. We're going to share their contact information at the end of the session. So at the end, you will find out how to find their website. Erin is the Director of Collections and Interpretations at the Florida Holocaust Museum. So I'm going to go ahead and take off my camera. Erin is going to introduce Marie, and we will learn about her story. Thank you, Erin and Marie. Good evening. My name is Erin Blankenship, just as you've just heard, and I have the honor of being actually the deputy director now of the Florida Holocaust Museum. We're so excited to partner with the Hillsborough County Public Library Cooperative on tonight's program, and I want to personally thank Amanda Jones and her team at the Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library for hosting this event, and to Jara Lugo and Fawn Walker from our museum for their assistance on our program tonight. If you've never visited, I want to encourage you to visit our museum in beautiful downtown St. Petersburg, so just over the bridge when we reopen to the public in January. Or if you're a member, you can come back as early as this weekend by reserving advanced tickets on our website, the FHM.org. And we can't wait to welcome you all back to the museum so that you can find out more about other individuals like Marie, tonight's speaker, who survived the Holocaust through our exhibitions, which feature their stories. You'll even see a few objects on view that Marie saved during her experience, which you'll hear about in just a moment. At the Florida Holocaust Museum, we believe that the best way to learn about the Holocaust is through the testimonies of survivors. So we are so happy that you will get to hear our speaker, Marie Silverman, share her experience. I've been fortunate, fortunate to hear Marie's story many times over the years, and it continues to touch me and to teach me new lessons about resilience, about hope, and about courage. I won't tell you any more of Marie's story because she will share it with you herself, but I will say what an honor it is to know Marie and how grateful I am to call her my friend. And so now please help me welcome Marie Silverman. Thank you, Erin, for that wonderful introduction. I would like to thank everyone for inviting me for this special event. I am a surviving victim of the Holocaust. And during World War II, I was in a camp. I was in hiding places and on the run to escape the Nazis. And in my earliest years, I lost the right to be alive. And these experiences had remained locked up within me for many years. My story is in memory of all those children that did not survive. I was born in Lens, France, and my sister Jeanette was born in Antwerp, Belgium, where we lived with our parents. We enjoyed a happy, normal family life. I went to school. 
I took violin lessons. And during the summer of 1938, my mother took my sister and I to visit our grandparents in Hungary and Czechoslovakia. It was the first time we were to meet them. And unfortunately, that was the last time anyone would ever see them. My grandparents, aunts, and uncles all were executed by the Nazis. Of nine brothers and sisters, my mother and one of her sisters were the only survivors. In the year 2007, I went to Poland and joined thousands of high school boys and girls on the March of the Living. We marched to the extermination, the extermination camps, Auschwitz and Birkenau. And all day, the names of the exterminated were on the loudspeaker. As I approached Birkenau, the name Moisha Berkovic, Czechoslovakia, was announced on the loudspeaker. That was my grandfather. I took my breath away, as it does even now. But I know now he is amongst one of the ash pits all around these premises. Continuing with this, this, my story, all our lives changed the morning of May 1940. I was nine years old and my sister was five and a half when bombs started falling all around us. The Germans had invaded Antwerp and we were among thousands to flee and seek refuge in France. The next four years were a time of fear and confusion. Wild bombs were fine falling all around us that May morning. My parents, sister, and I managed to run to the Antwerp train station with bare necessities. We were lucky to board a train heading towards France. I remember taking my prized possession, my violin. And after dropping it several times and slowing down the family's progress, my father said, Please leave it. I'll buy you a new one when we get settled. So I dropped it in the street. And no, I never did get another violin. The train made many stops. The German soldiers were visible on the train. And in Toulouse, France, my parents decided that it was time to get off the train. Why in Toulouse? I never found out. There we were hidden in the cellar on a farm by people who would put their own lives in jeopardy by helping Jews. We remained there for a short time until in August of 1940, somehow the Gestapo found our hiding place. They seized us and piled us in an open truck and transported us to a deportation camp in Perpignan, southwestern France. And the name of the camp was Rivesalt. That was the little hell before the big hell. Most people never heard of concentration camps in France, but they were scattered all around. The camp was very big and very bad. It had barrack type housing. My mother, sister, Jeanette and I were in one such overcrowded barrack. There were no beds and we were given a small amount of floor space that was covered with straw. Mother took whatever clothing she could spare and covered the straw. No plumbing, no inner walls, no privacy. 
the toilet was a bucket in the middle of the barrack for everyone to use. And selected women had to empty it daily in a designated place. There was an outhouse way away from the barrack with running cold water where we could wash. Needless to say, conditions in the camp were wretched. Sanitation was minimal. And we had no idea where our father was taken. Each day, a German soldier gathered the children into a room. We sat on cinder blocks and they made it appear as if they were teaching us, but I don't recall learning any lessons. Perhaps it was merely for show. We were not allowed to play outside. I'm sure it was because it would be hard for them to keep track of us. Hunger was a way of life. Bread, soup, if you would call it soup. I remember that my mother exchanged one of her undergarments for a crust of bread. And to this day, I do not throw bread out. We remained in the camp for several months. And news from the outside trickled into the camp through the underground network. My mother learned that Protestant couriers, that's men engaged to fight the Nazis, were able to reach our camp and smuggle children to a safe place. So one night after the camp was quiet and most people were asleep, mother took us out from the barrack and went to the place where the barbed wire did not meet the ground as specified, as specified. And as instructed by the resistant men, she crawled under first, and then she pulled Jeanette and I out. We escaped from the camp. It's a little side story. Mr. Walter Logenberg, may he rest in peace, the founder of our Holocaust Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida, has documents stating that his cousin Maurice had been in the French resistance during World War II. And he's the one that organized the escape network for Jewish children of Rivesvalt and Gors. Maurice did not survive. He was captured and shot. I live and able to tell my journey because Maurice Lobenberg's heroic deeds. When we escaped the camp, we walked through fields towards a train station mother was instructed to reach. And she handed us over to a courier. We didn't know him and we didn't know where we were going. Mother kissed us and said, we'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. We were terrified and bewildered. May 1941, this man who worked for the French resistance took us to an established hiding place for Czech children called L'Ecole Frenier, and that was in France, in France, in Vence, a mountainous region. We arrived malnourished and sick, and these wonderful people nursed us and dried our tears. Meanwhile, Mother, not knowing where my sister and I had been taken, had to get back to the camp to try and get my father out. I don't know how she did it, but miraculously, 
they found each other and both managed to flee to Nice. The odds of surviving such an attempt was nearly non-existent. And theirs was a fortunate exception. I can only surmise that their desperation to see my sister and I, perhaps for the last time, was so strong that they were willing to risk the consequences. And in time of crisis, one becomes strong. And that was my mother. And through the underground network, the two of them went into hiding in a private, safe home in Nice, not far from Vence, where Jeanette and I were hiding. Life in Vence was as normal as could be under the circumstances of the time. We attended classes and learned French, taught by French lay people who were sympathetic to our needs. I learned how to swim. I was quite an accomplished swimmer. Our parents wrote to us, sending the notes by underground messengers. And after several months had gone by, our parents took a chance and ventured from Nice to Vans. Of course, always with the help of the underground people. They arrived safely and undetected. I hardly recognized my father. He was a living skeleton. And shortly after our reunion, but my father died. Fortunately, my mother, sister, and I were around him. He died as a result of the severe treatment and conditions experienced in the camp. And much against my mother's orthodox religious background and beliefs, my mother buried our father in a Gentile cemetery in Vance. And because my father escaped from Rivzal and was due to be transported to an extermination camp, he was being pursued by the Vichy police. Mr. Joseph Fischer, a French resistant who knew who to trust to furnish false papers, and so my father was buried under the name of Bizek, religion Protestant. Mother did what she thought was best to protect our hiding place from being detected. And after the war, my mother moved our father's remains to a Jewish cemetery in Metz, France. That's northern part of France, where her only surviving sister lived and had burial grounds. As the war progressed, Vance no longer was a safe hiding place. And once again, we were on the move, secretly, not only my mother, sister, and I, but all the children in Bounce's hiding place. The underground, continuing their work to save the Jews from the Nazis, located a chateau several hours north of Bounce in a small town, also in the mountainous region, called saint agnon près de croc the chateau owners relinquished their home for the purpose of making it a safe haven for the Jewish children and the few adults that were to take care of them. We quietly left bounce by train in small groups and always being cautioned to be on our best behavior. 
and under no circumstance was there to be any conversation with anyone. So as not to draw any attention to ourselves. When we arrived in our new home, we had hoped that this might be our last trip towards freedom. But it was not to be. In August of 1943, mother was informed that in a nearby town, the Germans were rounding up the Jews. And their mission was to send them to the extermination camps. Again, mother was faced with the agony of having to send us away. And this time, she told us about the journey we, we were going to take. We pleaded with her and we cried, please, we don't want to go without you. But travel in Europe at that time was extremely dangerous for Jewish adults. So, once again, she handed us over to two couriers who led us away. And she watched us leave knowing she had no alternative. It was a matter of our survival. And these couriers had been hired and paid for by an aunt and uncle who had previously escaped from Belgium and were now living in Spain. My uncle was in the diamond business in Antwerp, and therefore, he was able to use the diamonds to purchase papers and able to make his way to Barcelona, Spain. So now we traveled by train to the foot of the Pyrenees Mountains. Then we crossed the Pyrenees on foot. And because we were children, these brave men took a chance by bringing us to safety. It was cold and we were not dressed for the weather and we were so afraid. We stopped frequently so that the guides could massage our feet to keep them from freezing. My sister's mouth was taped shut because she kept on crying. And to be heard meant death. The Nazis were all around us. Who could hear the gunshots? And the slightest noise would attract them to us. And if we were caught, we would be the victims of those guns. I remember when we left the chateau, a friend of mine gave me a little piece of paper with a prayer written in Hebrew. He said, this is for good luck. So I rolled it up real tight and put it in the hem of my coat. But I remember at this point, unbeknownst to the guys, I took it out and buried it. In case we were caught, I did not want to have that on me. It seemed like we walked forever. We made one stop where we received warm food and a real glass of milk and a bed to sleep in for a few hours before continuing our journey. And at the Spanish border, we boarded a train to Barcelona. And once again, we were instructed not to make a sound. The danger was great. We were traveling without papers. And once we re reached our destination, we were met by our aunt and uncle. We stayed in Barcelona for about six months while our aunt and uncle made arrangements to obtain visas to go to Canada. They had no trouble getting visas for themselves, but since we were not their children, 
it was impossible for them to arrange visas for Jeanette and I to travel with them. So after exhausting all avenues of assistance from government agencies, we finally were granted visas from the United Committee, United States Committee for the Care of European Children to go to America. So from Barcelona, Jeanette and I went to Lisbon, Portugal with our aunt and uncle, where we boarded a train, the SS Papinta, to make our journey. The crossing was rough, and for two weeks, I stayed in my cabin. I was so sick. So needless to say that to this day, I have not gone on a cruise. April 7th, 1944, we arrived in Philadelphia. We separated from our aunt and uncle as they continued on to Canada. And Jeanette and I were left on the dock crying and alone until we were met by a member of the Committee for the Care of European Children. They accompanied us to Newark, New Jersey, where we were placed in an orphanage until the committee, with the help of local Jewish organizations, found a foster home for us in Providence, Rhode Island. My sister and I lived in the same home until the end of that summer. Then, for the first time in our lives, we were separated. We were each placed with different families. They were one, they are wonderful families, Jewish families. I still remain in touch with my foster sister. We visit back and forth when we're able. It was at least one year after our arrival in America before we had news from our mother. And with the help of the Red Cross and Jewish Family Services in 1949, that's five years after Jeanette and I arrived in Providence, our mother joined us. It was a beautiful reunion. A bit sad. My mother was astonished. She left babies. Here we are, teenagers. I already had met my future husband. I did not know then, nor could I have known, the self-denial, the bravery, the courage my mother had to save our lives. Some parents would not have considered sending their children away, and many never saw their children again. I speak to you of the evils of the Holocaust. I am a credible witness. But the generation of survivors are disappearing. Therefore, I hope that by sharing my experience, you, your children, your grandchildren will stand up to protect the memory of the Holocaust. The memory must be kept alive. And to those who say, and deny the Holocaust ever existed, I, who survived such horrors, speaks convincingly, not only to share the effects of my experience, but also to celebrate my existence. I have a few 
story. I want to share something with you. That once we were in Providence, we started school. They put me in a French class so that I could learn the bare, bare necessities for converse, conversation in English. I stayed there until the end of the school year. That was the eighth grade they put me in. And after the summer and my friends who proceeded to introduce me to the proper English, some good, some not so good, but they tried to make me an American. The fall, I entered the ninth grade and with the help of wonderful teachers, I graduated high school with honors. I entered college. I learned to be secretary and a bookkeeper. And I married my husband. We were married for 50 years when he passed away, which is already 21 years. I have three children, I have three grandchildren. I do a lot of volunteer work, hoping that I can somehow make up for being here. I also wanna say that my mom, when we moved to Florida, lived with us in the winter. And since my sister remained in Providence, so my mother went to Providence for the summer. My mother lived to see grandchildren and one great grandchild. And that's the rest of today's happy ending. And I am so pleased to be here with you people. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Marie, for sharing that. Um, we, we have a lot of questions, a lot of comments. Before we get right into the questions, um, I do want to pull up, we had pulled up earlier, and I do want to pull up again the picture of you and your sister Jeanette and the picture of the map just so people can get a better idea of really how big your journey was. So let's go ahead. I'm just going to pull that up so they can see and make sure we have everybody can see that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first we have here is you and your sister Jeanette. So about how old were you in this picture? I probably was uh, around seven. No, about uh, eight, and my sister was about three and a half. Okay, so we have that, and then um, I'm going to move to the map. So we're going to pull up the map here, and we can see, you know, um, oops, there it goes. Just my really, you know, how much territory you covered, and like you said, some on foot, trains, just all, you know, really, and for somebody your age, what a what a large scale you covered just to to escape that. So that is this, what we're pulling up. And you can feel free to let us know anything about. This, this journey that you see on the map took four years out of my life, young life, four years. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. And keeping in mind what you said earlier, you were at that young age separated from your parents. For, for most of that time. So even imagining um, just something for the, the young people to think about it. Cause I know we have, a, I'm seeing we have a lot of students in the audience. So we do have, um, we do have that. Well, we'll leave the map up for a little bit. We do have, if you're ready, we do have some questions, Marie. I'm gonna just be reading them. As I mentioned, we're gonna try to get to as many as possible. The first thing I wanna say is before we do questions, we have a lot of comments. So you have a lot of love coming from the audience tonight. We have a lot of people saying thank you for sharing your story. We also have, um, you have a lot of fans out there I can see from um, around the world. So that is our first. Our first one is just thank you, thank you, thank you. And then we will get into some of the questions. 
So, okay, so I've, I've written some down and I'm still monitoring the ones that are coming in. And this is a reminder that if you have not submitted a question, feel free, you can still do that. We're gonna try to get to as many as possible. So you mentioned this a little bit with your, um, your foster siblings. Did you stay in contact with anyone you met on your journey? Um, yes, um, my husband and I traveled to France and we stopped at the chateau prior to stopping there we spoke to the woman and she says oh she remembered and she was part of the holocaust also and she said she has many people coming by that were lodged in the chateau the same time as i was i left my name and address today i emailed back and forth to a friend in france in fact i was an email uh, just before I came here, came on the uh, program. Uh, she, so we we're back and forth, yes, and it's pleasant. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, um, the wonders of technology. And this leads into one of our second questions is, you mentioned you've never, uh, you never wanted to go on a cruise again. Have you been back to visit Europe ever? Europe, yes. My husband and I traveled through through France. We traveled um, um, we really extensively. We uh, went to the uh, Vance, the hiding place, but I was never never wanted to go back to Ribsau to the camp. So uh, we missed on that, but we traveled a lot. My husband and I. We uh, went to Israel a couple of times. We uh, went to uh, Brazil. I had a cousin that lived in Brazil. So we visited visited him. And uh, much more, we went up throughout the United States, especially the, uh, the um, uh, mountainous regions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and this is actually, um, you mentioned you you had not been back to visit the camps in France and somebody is specifically thanking you because they said they didn't know about, they didn't know that there were camps in France. They've heard about the ones in Germany. So they wanted to thank you specifically for sharing your story, but also saying, uh, why do you think maybe uh, that is less known than, than, the, than the German concentration camps? Possibly because they just brought them into these specific places, like they brought, caught us and put us in Ribza. There was Drancy, which is a famous, horrible camp where they shot them right on the premises there in France. Mm -hmm. Why? I have no idea. Well, it's to get rid of us, you know? They never. They didn't succeed. No, they did not. Um, and then I was mentioning, well, we have, we have, it looks like we have quite the age range of people in the audience tonight, but I can see that we do have some students with us. Mm -hmm. So I think this is from one of our students. What do you hope people gain or learn from listening to your story? Uh, that there is hope. And that's what I traveled with hope that tomorrow will be better. And as long as these children study and learn, they will know how to survive as I did. But they need to study. It's important. Very good advice. Uh, we do have some questions about languages, so I'm going to put some of those together. Our first question is, are you still fluent in French? i not fluent, but I do speak French, <laughs> yes. And then um, our second question was, so as we can see on the map, you, I mean, you were in many different places. How did you communicate with people in, in the different areas when you were, didn't speak the language? I did not have to, my parents did, you know, so I, I just went along with my parents. 
and whatever, um, Flemish, you know, and uh, Yiddish. And of course, wherever we were, we were amongst, you know, hidden Jews. So that's there, how- There we, was some community there as well amongst yeah. the, um, amongst that. I'm actually, I'm gonna pull down the map for just a little while, just so people can, uh, we'll pull it back up at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that off for just a little while. And then we will get into some more questions. Um, one question is, how many other children were in hiding with you in Vance at the Chateau? Oh, they probably were about um, 15, 20 children. Mm -hmm. And one of them was the um, uh, the, the um, uh, my friend who I correspond with uh, in France, and she was uh, she kind of kept me abreast of all the people that stayed in France, you know, from there. Mm -hmm. Um, this so this is a question. Now you you were mentioned the journey took four years, and and by the time you were reunited with your mother, ultimately again. You had grown quite a bit, but some of our viewers want to know when this all started. You were you were very young. They want to know: Do you think you fully understood what was happening, or it wasn't until later that, when you were a little bit older, that you understood the whole scope of it? As this as this started, I didn't know why. I was, as I said before, bewildered. I don't know why we're running. I don't know wh what's happening. I was not informed. My, my parents actually uh, kept it from us. So I really didn't know until the time came, like in the camp, where I reality set in. This is what's happening to us. So that is, and yeah, part of just being younger at the time. Yeah. Okay, um, this is another question. So you mentioned at the beginning, uh, you played the violin. People want to know, did you ever continue with the violin? No, I never did. It was like, you know, a curtain over that. But I was very fortunate to have been able to uh, kind of push my one of my children into playing and play beautifully. So it gave me pleasure on that. <laughs> okay, so this is a question about when you were traveling uh, by foot across the Pyrenees. Mm -hmm. Could you please describe the weather or climate at that time? Uh, also, just to give us a perspective because, you, you know, did the, did the seasons change? Did you have coats? How many layers of clothing did you have? So what, what was that like? we had very little on. And as I said, we weren't dressed properly for the weather there, which was snowy. And uh, um, we, it was cold. It was cold. And these guys made, you know, try to make us more comfortable, but it was difficult. And don't forget, you know, when you, I love to watch, the Tour de France in the Pyrenees, thinking maybe I'll see something. Oh. It's totally different. They have uh, they have uh, roads there now, and when we traveled there, no, it was just uh, rough roads, rough um, um, passage, and that's the way it had to be, so that they wouldn't would not uh, find us. So, right, so you weren't, even at what there was at the time, which is much different than it is now, was. but even then you, you couldn't be on the main roads for no. even for what they were. They had it at that time. Right. Many years ago, you know? Right, so everything that's changed since then. Um, we do have a question about your mom. Did she, uh, How did your mother, find you and your sister? Did she ever share with you more of her journey that she went through when you were separated? My mother would not talk about it. She clammed up every time you try to 
because I wanted to know a few things. She clammed up that I wouldn't touch her, would not. She became so upset. She was right. She was afraid. She was afraid that if she revealed too much, they might catch her. Okay. So this, she went to her grave with all the all the information. The, but, uh, and that's very, you know, very understandable considering the trauma that mm -hmm. she had experienced. Uh, we do have a question, and I think this one is from a student. Uh, I know we are getting close on time, but we'll try, if you have time, Marie, we'll try to get a few more in. At the time when you were being persecuted when you were young, and I, I believe this one is from a student, so we might want to help explain this. How did the Nazis know you were Jewish, or how did they know if a family was Jewish? There were um, uh, people who would, uh, um, uh, what, what's the word that I want? Uh, they were people who were aware of uh, our, our being Jewish, just like on the farmhouse. How would they, how did the Gestapo find us? Somebody squealed. Right, so it was um, many, people, many squealers. Let me put it that way. So um, it, 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 yeah, that it was from sometimes maybe friends or neighbors or or that that yeah. sort of thing was the, that the neighbors saw that their neighbor's home was not uh, functioning as usual. But there we were in the cellar. We were not allowed to go outside. Maybe just just there too. Just maybe for a breath of fresh air during the middle of the night. Right. Um, we do have a question about Jeanette. They want to, uh, and I and I do know the answer, so that's why I'm asking the question. Uh, is Jeanette okay? So they wanted to to see what happened to her when she got to America. Well, she became a real American teenager. Yes, she did well in school. She also went to uh, Bryant College and uh, she got married. She had two sons. She has four grandchildren and a great grandchild just this year. So, yes. Oh, she congratulations. Was. Congratulations on that. Yeah. Um, and we do have. Well, and I do want to say again, you you have a big fan club out there. So I um I think you have some of those family members, some of your kids and grandkids, and some of your nieces and nephews are also out there watching and wishing you well and cheering you on. Uh, they're very proud of you, they say. So um I do think unfortunately we are uh do we we are running out of time. So I'll ask one more uh maybe one more question about the museum. So how did you, you mentioned the founder of the Florida Holocaust Museum, mm -hmm. um, the founder you had been in contact with. People wanted to know a little bit about the items you shared with the museum. Is that, or were those things you were able to carry with you on your journey? Was there, I think it's kind of, we have two questions here. Is there anything you were able to keep, you know, from your young life that you were able to take with you because that's that's a lot to go through to keep a, a physical item and then were some of those things that you shared with the holocaust museum the florida holocaust museum everything that i have found and i when i started with my story because when i became a member when it first started and my husband was a study to be a docent and he prompted me pushed me to be to talk. So at that point, I knew the basic of my story, but it wasn't enough for me. So I went and found, I researched, I researched everything that I am saying, I found being the truth. I have so many uh, files of who said what, and I met people. I'm, well, that's the way I did it because I couldn't find it out anything from my mother. The, the, the holes in my um, uh, story, you know? 
right? Well, and that's, I mean, that's such a good lesson to everybody to you, you lived it, but you went out and you, you did your research as well. Yes. Um, yeah. So, well, that is a good opportunity. I'm actually going to bring up if people do want to learn more about this topic in this time period, uh, I am going to bring up some information. So if you want to find out more, we have shared, uh, Aaron was kind enough to share information with us about the Florida Holocaust Museum, what is going on there right now. You can definitely visit them at the FHM.org. That's the Florida Holocaust Museum. You'll find out more information, more, you can find out more about the topic, more about booking speakers if you're interested in a program like that. So we just, Really want to share that information with you. What you can see, um, she Aaron mentioned some of your items are even on display at the, yes. the museum. So you can see uh -huh. the items that Marie has donated there. I do want to let you know if you do have any questions for the library, if you want to contact us or you want to find out about upcoming programs, it's very easy. Check us out at our website, hcplc.org, if you want to contact slash contact, or you can always give us a call at 813. 273-3652. And I just want to reiterate um, again, Marie, how appreciative we are as the library and the audience. The overwhelming majority of comments have just been thank you. Um, I do want to share this, um, this maybe a nice closing comment. Thank you for blessing us with your story this evening. So we do want to say a big thank you for joining us and to um, thank you to everyone who came to the program tonight. So I guess this is, we have run out of time. But uh, if we, do you have, have any closing thoughts, Marie, before we sign off? Just thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I'm so happy that people are hearing about the Holocaust. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. And um, we will wish everyone a good evening and we will, we will sign off. So we'll say goodbye. Thank you.